uh, coming to, to the top, uh, minimal hepatic encephalopathy. In the past, it used to be called as the subclinical hepatic encephalopathy. And now the new name like the covert hepatic encephalopathy has also been suggested. So my framework uh, of my talk would be, first I would discuss the classification, followed by the burden of the hepatic encephalopathy and the minimal HE, health related quality of the life in these patients, prognosis, pathogenesis, diagnosis, and finally the treatment, if we have or we can suggest also. Coming to the overall hepatic encephalopathy, how do we define it? H is broadly defined as a brain dysfunction caused by the liver insufficiency and or autosystemic shunting, which manifests as a wide spectrum of the neurological or psychiatric abnormalities ranging from subclinical or minimal alteration to the coma. Means two things. One is liver insufficiency from the hepatocytes and there's the shunting also. Alcoholic related liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, viral hepatitis and primary biliary cholangitis can all affect the brain through different mechanisms, independent from those triggered by the liver failure or the dysfunction. That is something I am not going to discuss in today's talk. And it is widely considered to be reversible following liver transplantation. I am talking of the hepatic encephalopathy. But the neuroinflammation and neuronal cell death are the features of the hepatic encephalopathy and the episodes of the overt hepatic encephalopathy can lead to irreversibility. So there are many studies when the liver transplant was done and looked uh, initially we uh, thought that it is completely reversible, but the recent studies have demonstrated that they are not reversible and this is because of the neuronal cell death. And the more, it is also the most frequent complication of the cirrhosis that leads to multiple hospitalization and the, uh, uh, in these patients. So coming to the classification and the nomenclature, you all know three different types have been described in the ASLD as well as the ESL guidelines, A, B, C. A stands basically for the acute liver failure, where it is totally the liver insufficiency. B stands for the portosystemic uh, shunting or B for the bypass. And the C is usually seen in patient with the cirrhosis where you get the component of both liver insufficiency as well as the shunting also. Coming to the grade, you all know the cons classification as far as the grading is concerned. Uh, they des uh, he described grade 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the later on, in patients who do not have any abnormalities, neurological or the psychiatric, on the clinical examination and mini-mental score is normal. And if you do some psychometric or the psychophysiological test, neurophysiological test, they are abnormal. And this entity initially was called subclinical hepatic encephalopathy or latent hepatic encephalopathy, but nowadays we call it the minimal hepatic encephalopathy. But recently, you can see over here that uh, these two, they are combined now and they are called as the covert and against the overt. It is basically the sound for the overt hepatic encephalopathy overt. So they named it the covert. Otherwise, nothing very special about it. As far as the time course is considered, it could be the episodic, recurrent, or the persistent. And the finally, it could be the spontaneous or the precipitated. Precipitated means when you get some factor which can precipitate, for example, uh, like the constipation, bleeding, diarrhea, electrolyte disturbances. There are so many causes about it. Just to look at what is this uh, episodic or recurrent persistent and the minimal. Just concentrate on the left side of the, your figure, first A, that is one. Here you can see the clinical detection level. So whenever there is an encephalopathy, there is alteration in the sensorium, which is clinically visible and can be uh, quantified also. 
and ultimately it touches to the normal that there is no problem but if the episodes happens more than one within six months we call it the recurrent otherwise it is the episodic one come to the second one here you can say the clinical detection level and all the time there is a clinical manifestation of the altered sensorium so it is not touching to the normal or so you call it the persistent but here if there is no abnormality detected clinically on examination and if you do the neuropsychiatric or the neurophysiological tests if they are not normal you call them the minimal hepatic encephalopathy and although you call it the minimal but it is not that minimal minimal there are uh, consequences of the minimal hepatic encephalopathy as well coming to here you can see the spectrum the spectrum of the sensorium starting from the normal to the minimal what i have just told you and then the overt hepatic encephalopathy grade one two three and the four that we all know about it and grade two is something that uh, there is very less inter observer variation also and as well as the intra observer if you get any kind of the disorientation or the asterisk then it is the grade two hepatic encephalopathy and in the rest, when you do the neuropsychiatric or neurophysiological test, and if you detect the abnormality, you call it the uh, uh, minimal hepatic encephalopathy or grade one. And that is something that nowadays is called as the covert hepatic encephalopathy. What is the implication? There are the many questions and there are many people also they oppose this kind of the classification minimal or grade one to the covert hepatic encephalopathy and there are reasons for it because they differentiated the normal grade one and the minimal hepatic encephalopathy and then they followed this patient for a long time you can see over here about 300 to the 400 days about a year or so and what they have demonstrated here you can see the line the upper one is unimpaired and this is a minimal hepatic encephalopathy and this is the grade one. The grade one, they have the higher number of the complication in these patients. And similarly, they have the higher mortality for 20% against the four to 5% in an MHE or MHE group also. And when they have done investigations, although looking at the pathogenesis, what they have found, MELD score was similar between the groups, but grade one hepatic encephalopathy patients had increased frequency of the bacterial translocation and the neutrophil spontaneous respiratory burst that you all know, compared to the patients with minimal hepatic encephalopathy or no hepatic encephalopathy. You all know simple animal limit test also. What they have also shown that it is grossly abnormal in these patients. It is the no recent information. So what I'm trying to say that they, there is one group of the thought that they should not be put together uh, grade one as well as the minimal hepatic encephalopathy because grade one HE have additional prognostic and the possibly also the therapeutic implications. That is the one. Overall, hepatic encephalopathy has a very poor prognosis. You can see the survival is only 42% at 12 months. The, the ward, I would say approximately 60 to 70% of the beds are occupied by the patient with the acute on chronic liver failure. In simple terms, I would say they have the two things underlying chronic liver disease, whether it may be detected or not detected also, but superimposed is an acute event. It could be the viral, it could be the alcohol, it could be the drugs, many other things, or the flares of the hepatitis B or the autoimmune hepatitis. We call it the acute on chronic liver failure. And these are the patients, they have the higher degree of the systemic inflammation and higher grades of the liver cell failure. What I'm trying to say that although they have the underlying liver disease, but their presentation is something like the ELF also. And uh, uh, here is the largest studies by the Juan Cordova from the Spain. 
the left panel uh, left uh, cartoon is very simple that uh, as uh, uh, there is a cumulative incidence of the mortality which is increasing as the grade of the hepatic encephalopathy increases similarly see over here if, if there is no aclf the mortality is less but if there is a presence of the ACLS, overall the mortality is high. But if you see the ACLF along with the HE, they have the highest mortality, which is many times higher than the simple uh, uh, patient with the decompensated cirrhosis. So if, if we have to compare the people uh, where the uh, hepatic encephalopathy is not associated with the ES, uh, ACLF, these are the patients who are older and inactive drinkers without severe liver failure or systemic inflammatory reaction. And most of the time you will find this is a precipitated one hepatic encephalopathy because one or other cause of the precipitant. Now come to the hepatic encephalopathy which is associated with the ACLF. They are the younger cirrhotic, more frequently they are alcoholics and they have the higher ammonia level, severe liver failure, reduced jugular venous oxygen saturation and systemic inflammatory response which is marked and this is related to basically the bacterial infection active alcoholism and or dilutional hyponatremia so nowadays they say that uh, uh, there is a fourth group of the hepatic encephalopathy which has the distinct characteristics pathogenesis and the outcome we should uh, also, in fact, in one of our recent paper published uh, recently, ACLF and HEV proposed that there should be a fourth group, that is the group D, a type D, that is related to the ACLF. Coming to the economic burden, as far as the minimal hepatic encephalopathy is concerned, the economic burden has not been assessed. But if you see that there are the studies which have demonstrated or have reported that the 50% of the patient with the minimal HE, they don't have a regular appoint, uh, employment compared to only 15% without uh, minimal HE. And 44% of these patients with a minimal HE, they are unfit to work. And the falls and the fall related injuries they create the economic as well as the social burden, not only to the patient, but also to their families or the caregivers. So the burden is huge. And uh, we have also demonstrated, and one more uh, group from the Bajaj, they have demonstrated that there is a higher caregiver burden in terms of the finances also. And this is the study for the caregiver burden in the patient with the cirrhosis as well as the MHE. We have particularly looked at the MHE also. Just please note over here, the cirrhotic influences the negatively the family unit with respect to work. Only 56% were employed. And the finances are involved and the medical adherence for the issues also. Cirrhotic with the previous HE or MHE also, they have the worst employment in this study and the worst financial status, although it has been demonstrated earlier also. And they post a higher uh, caregiver burden, particularly if it is the spouse and the repeated hospital admissions, alcohol as etiology and the lower social equity were the independent predictors of the caregiver uh, um, burden also. So there is very limited information as far as the economic burden is concerned. So uh, when we say that it is a minimal hepatic encephalopathy, it comes that it is a very minimal. It does not have any consequences as far as uh, uh, um, prognosis and the mortality or the development of the overt hepatic encephalopathy is concerned, but it is not true. I'll just give you this again, just please look at it uh, carefully. If there is a cognitive decline which is associated with the minimal or covert hepatic encephalopathy, it results in the decreased work productivity, I've just told you. They have a higher tendency for the falls 
and they have increased risk of the overt hepatic encephalopathy development as well as having the higher mortality also. And more importantly, I think this is a question for the debate always, which has not been solved so far. That is the fitness to the drive also. And they have plenty of the sleep disturbances, burden I have just told you, care government I have told you, and they have the impaired quality of the life. Coming straight to the health related quality of the life, you all know it is a very broad and the multi dimensional concept which includes all aspects of the human well being physical and cognitive skills, social functioning, and set of the emotions and the psychological status. And the health related quality of the life worsens with the progressions of the chronic liver disease to the advanced cirrhosis. I think this is very common observation from a uh, general physician also. So quality of the life in a patient who has decompensated is much more worse because of the repeated hospitalizations also and the development of the many other complications. So there are several instruments, I would tell you the three which are commonly used. One is the SF36 and sickness impact, impact profile and the CLDQ also. SF36 contains the 36 question split into uh, eight domains so with physical component and the mental component summary scores. SIP that we have used in our studies contain 136 question, 12 domains along with the total psychosocial, total physical, and the total SIP score. CLDQ has 29 question split in eight domains, emotional, systemic, activity, abdominal symptoms, fatigue, and the worry. So these are the instruments, I would say, through which we uh, uh, basically look for the quality of the life in this patient. This is one of the our study which was published in 2007 in a pathology, quite famous study, widely quoted also. Here are the results of the SIP score in patients. The lower one is the patient who do not have minimal HE above one hepatic encephalopathy. And if you see the all domains except one, which is the communication, the scores are worse in patients with the MHE. Uh, and the patient with the MHE often have a, if you look at the patient with the minimal HE, where is the problem actually? The problem, they often have a preserved basic day-to-day -day functioning, but the complex activities like driving or even the gardening, which requires the attention, information processing and the psychomotor skill, such as the planning a trip, driving or gardening, they are often affected. So whenever we have to look for the MHE, whenever we have to quantify, whenever we have to see whether it is present or absent, I think these areas need to be exploited through the investigations also. And the, another one is uh, that is the matter of the concern is the sleep or the rest. They have very poor sleep. I will come uh, short to it shortly also, but I would like to tell you one thing that there are many things when we were performing this uh, uh, study and looking at the health related quality of the light. So there were many confounders, severity of the liver disease, presence or absence of the portal hypertension, etiology, alcohol versus non-alcohol, educational status, many more things also. But these, when we have done the multiple uh, multivariate analysis, we showed that only the presence of the minimal H significantly affected the total SIP score. A SIP score is basically the quality of life score also. So I have just told you that there are lots of the sleep disturbances and our group has also worked on it. One of my very bright uh, students also, he worked on it. Now he's working as a consultant in the PGI Chandigarh and what uh, uh, the, uh, the, it is shown that sleep disturbances are present in 26 to 70 percent of the cirrhosis patients and more frequently noted in those who have the minimal HE. They have delayed initiation and the frequent awakening. 
which leads to the reduced sleep time and excessive daytime sleepiness. And this is the excessive daytime sleepiness which results in the poor quality of the life also. If you look at the sleep disturbances at the night are not uh, related to the HE, hepatic encephalopathy, but to the abnormalities in circadian rhythms, uh, circadian rhythm found in these patients and include dysfunctional retinal suprachiasmatic nucleus pineal pathway and the impaired melatonin hepatic clearance from the cirrhotic liver also. So they are responsible. And uh, there are the studies what they have de demonstrated, diet induced with oral amino acid, induced hyperammonia, induced daytime sleepiness in parallel with the rise in the ammonia level among the, the patients who are having the cirrhosis of liver as well as the HE, but the sleep disturbances were noted in patients who have the cirrhosis of the liver. Coming to the next one that I've just told you, the falls. The falls. Here you can see over here that the incidence uh, of the previous falls, it has been uh, seen in one of the very good uh, study published in AJG also, but they have demonstrated in patient with the MHE, the uh, incidence of the previous falls was 40% compared to 13% or the 12% in patient without MHE or in controls. But if you look at what happens as a consequence of the fall, there would with the contusion, wound and the fracture and the severe injury like wound and the fracture was much more common in patients with the MHG 22% with service 9% and the 5%. I think the falls are the very important thing and whenever these patients comes to our OPD or anywhere, we have to tell them about the precautions to be taken to prevent a fall, a injuries from the fall also. The fall as a risk in the cirrhosis. It is not only the minimal hepatic encephalopathy and because of the cognitive uh, dysfunction or because of the maintaining of the posture results in the fall, but there are many more. These patients, they do have the Parkinsonism, that is the hepatic Parkinsonism and which is responsible, uh, responsible for the disbalance as well as the gait disorder and may cause the fall. Similarly, lower activity muscle strength loss. Autonomic dysfunction is seen in these patients. They can cause the postural dizziness and le leading to the falls also. And I've just told you the sleep problems is causing the daytime sleepiness and which can also cause the fall. I think whenever we are approaching such patients in our OPD or wherever, I think uh, these must be in our mind and we must give the prepare. And moreover, these patients, they are osteopenic, osteoporosis increases the risk of the fractures in these patients also. Now, the, the very important uh, question I think uh, many of you must be having in your mind, should we, uh, should we allow the patient to drive or not? I think answer is not clear. But the only thing that I'll uh, present in front of you, the literature. Similarly to the false, there are problems with the affects the driving and it is not only the minimal hepatic encephalopathy or the chronic hepatic encephalopathy, there are the medical conditions, means comorbidities that these patients, they have, they have, they might have the heart disease, they might have the lung diseases, as well as the strokes and many other things. Aging also, inattention, distraction, impaired visions also, Prescription of the drugs, they are taking many drugs also, might have the also causing the sedation and they might be taking the other drugs which are uh, uh, have not to be used, alcohol and the fatigue. They can all influence the driving also against the background that a person can have. Let us discuss now uh, the minimal hepatic uh, encephalopathy and the fitness to the drive. What is the safe driving? Safe driving basically involves the psychomotor coordination, audio-visual perception, attention, and short-term recall and the cognition. And they are all abnormal. And 
Associate they, uh, MSG is basically associated with the poor driving skills, both on real road driving tests as well as on the simulator. There are many studies on the real road, and I'll tell you one on the real. Uh, it was way back in 2004. It was published, uh, and uh, it looked at the, the impairment in categories like the car handling, maneuvering, adaptation, cautiousness. Uh, they compare MHE versus non MHE as well as the normal persons also. And these patients, uh, cirrhotic patients who are the minimal HE, it has been uh, demonstrated that they have less insight into their driving skills and tend to overestimate their driving skills. They feel that everything is fine. They can drive. There's no issue. Let them drive. But this is the study that I'm just talking of that uh, the driving was assessed on four domains, car handling, adaptation, cautiousness, and maneuvering. And if you see also the, the blue bar, which is the patient with the MHG, they have the worst uh, performance in all four, uh, four categories when compared to those who do not have the MHG and the controls also. And it is the inter uh, instructors, uh, in instructor's intervention that took place in 36% in patients with cirrhosis and MHG, vis-a-vis uh, uh, MHG, without MHG and the controls. And it was a basically a standardized on-road driving test and they had to drive 22 miles in 90 minutes or so. And uh, there's one study where on the simulator performance, they showed that if they are given the treatment from the in the form of rifaximin, it improves the performance also. So, the uh, Ishan International Society of Hepatic Encephalopathy and Nitrogen Metabolism, and in the last meeting in 2018 in the USA, there were some consensus statements about it. What we have to do to these patients as far as the looking at the fitness to driving also. Family, uh, the physician must be familiar with the local legislation regarding mandatory reporting <coughs> to the local traffic authorities. A short objective and non-judgmental driving history should be taken at each visit. For example, do you drive? Have you had any accident or near misses and so on and so forth? Or even if the, some caregiver is there, you can ask them all these questions also. What's about the driving of the patient, whether it is the same or it has deteriorated. And special care should be taken to cognitively evaluate patients with cirrhosis who are active drivers or and have recently three months and had an episode of the overt hepatic encephalopathy. Those who have overt HE, I think uh, to my personal, if you ask, they should not be allowed to try unless until they uh, have shown the, the fitness uh, on, the, on the driving uh, uh, from the formal driving uh, reassessment with the local authorities uh, based upon the local regulations also. I, I find only one contraindication where the driving should not be allowed. One, if they are in overt hepatic encephalopathy, whether it's grade one or the grade two, they should not be allowed, or they have just recently recovered from an episode of the overt HC, they should not be allowed. And the restarted resumption should be based upon the formal driving reassessment. So this is uh, the driving. We can have the question answers also on this uh, subject. Coming to the prognosis, in my initial slide, I said the patient with the MHG, they are more likely to have the episodes of the overt HG as well as the mortality also. Let us look at it. We were the first to look at the natural history of the at that time, we used to call it the subclinical hepatic encephalopathy, and from the same institute here. <clears throat> in 165 patients with cirrhosis, we diagnosed MHE and 103 
and uh, we had a follow up of the six month what we have demonstrated that the mhc developed in 22.6% of these patient and those who do not did not have the mhc only 5.6% and among the patient with the MHC, the development of the overt HC was more common in patient with the child score above six, seven or more uh, than with the child score of the less. Means the poor uh, liver functions also contributed as far as the development of the overt HC is concerned. Is another study published in 2000 also. Here the follow up was a little longer, 36 months. And what they have demonstrated, those who have the minimal hepatic encephalopathy, they had an episode of overt HG in 56% compared to only 8% who did not have the MHG. So this conclusively demonstrated that they have uh, a propensity for development or the to the over. Another, the, the recent study in 2017, looking at the three, developing OHG, development of the first complication and the time to the death, that's the mortality. In all these three parameters, you can see that the patient with the MHG, that they performed very poorly. And in the developing OHG, over HG, they, they developed in 17.6% at the end of the one year, while it remained persistent in 42% and the result in 19% only. So the predictor of the over HG, what they have demonstrated, hypoalbuminemia, and the predictor of the mortality, the higher creatinine level, and the predictor of developing first cirrhosis related component, that is the high creatinine, high MELD score, as well as the low platelets also. This is again very, very important study, uh, reaffirming the findings that have been demonstrated earlier also. And this is our another study where we have said the survival is also affected. Can you see over here? And this was related to the cognitive performance of a patient. FES is the uh, the, the test where we diagnose this patient, if it is less than minus six, and then it is associated with the higher mortality also. Coming to the pathogenesis, I think in single terms, I would say uh, that the pathogenesis of the MHG is no different than the pathogenesis of a hepatic encephalopathy in a cirrhotic patient. What I'm trying to say over here, SIBO along with the intestinal barrier uh, integrity, impaired uh, intestinal uh, integrity as well as prolonged orocecal transit time, they have the dysbiosis. And this dysbiosis causes the endotoxemia. And these are the endotoxin, lipopolysaccharide, peptidoglycan, lipoproteins, and the various lipopeptides. What you also call that the PAMP, pathogen-associated molecular pattern also. And this is all because of the increased bacterial translocation from the gut to the stream also. And these PAMPs, they interact with the TLR, toll-like uh, receptors also, which are present in the Kupfer cells, the endothelial cells, many more cells also, and they initiate the liver injury and make the liver fibrosis. But more importantly, they causes the systemic inflammation. The cytokines like TN-alpha, IL-1 and IL-6, they are released in the circulation also. And these, they cause the one kind of the <coughs> cycle kind of thing that they further causes the dysbiosis as well as the intestinal barrier integrity. And if you see, if there is a dysbiosis, then the prior probiotic may be the choice also. I will also discuss this one. So I have just covered this one over here and you this slide shows that you have the ammonia because of the gut diaper. Uh, dysbiosis and you have the systemic inflammation also the mechanism I just told you and there is a they act synergistically also this uh, cytokines they may pass through the blood brain barrier and can directly affect the microglial cells we get activated and following that in there is there is the in situ synthesis of these pro-inflammatory cytokines TNL for one and IL-1 and IL-6 and what you call basically 
the neuroinflammation which plays an important role so any level of the neuroinflammation i just repeat any level of the inflammation neuroinflammation can cause the cognitive dysfunction as well as the cognitive dis decline what you call as the minimal hepatic encephalopathy and we have also demonstrated in these patients, those who are having the MHC, they have the SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that we have seen in 102 patients with, and we found in 57. And the, in MHC, it is 38.6%, we say it's 8.9%. And if you see, the, look at the patient who have the poor functions, the liver function, it goes up to the 70% also. And these patients, they have the delayed orocecal transit time also. And the multivariate analysis have demonstrated in this group of the patient also that the SIBO is the only factor associated with the MHG. And it tells you the importance of the, the if you think of the SIBO, the gut antibiotics also, prebiotics and the prokinetics also. I've already the, taken 40, 45 minutes. No issue if I take another 20 minutes. Go ahead, please. Okay. Make it. Yeah. I think uh, many studies nowadays, they are focusing on the microbiota, I, I, which is entirely out of scope of this talk also. But I'll let you know one thing. What is the cirrhosis dysbiosis ratio? This is the ratio of autocathinous bacteria with non autocathinous. Autocathinous, they are the commensals and potentially beneficial bacteria. They, are the, uh, they include the Ruminococci, Lachnospiracy, and Crossridials cluster. And uh, harmful, do you all know, the Enterobacteriaceae and the Bacteriaceae. And these two families, basically, I will tell you, they are related to the inflammation. They are causing the product of these bacteria when they come in, in the, uh, they cross the barrier and they cause a lot of things, uh, PAMS also. So these are the different values. In controls, if you look at the CDR, uh, uh, the anikisirosis dysbiosis ratio, the, it is 2.05, compensated 0.89, but it further decreased over here. And the MHC comes over here, somewhere here. So the, uh, it makes it rational. Either you go ahead with the liver transplantation. If indication is not there, then the probiotics may be useful in subgroup of these patients also. Another concept of the cognitive decline or the cognitive abnormalities in patient with um, minimal HE is that it has been demonstrated the low-grade cerebral edema in these patients. You all know in acute liver failure, there is overt cerebral edema, which is causing all kinds of the complications here. But it has been demonstrated in cirrhosis, particularly those on the acute and chronic liver failure or those who are having, those who had hepatic encephalopathy or minimal HG, they might also have the cerebral edema. That's what we have looked in this study. And you all know magnetized transfer ratio, if it is low, that signifies that there is a cerebral edema. And uh, we looked at its correlation with the IL-6, that is the pro-inflammatory cytokine, as well as the ammonia. And we found a good correlation also. We also looked at the MTR values with the FES, psychometric hepatic encephalopathy score, which is the gold standard for diagnosing the MHG. I'll come to this part also, that is also correlated. And what we have further observed, the low-grade cerebral edema observed in patients with cirrhosis and minimal HG, it was reversible. And this is a very beautiful study that we have done in such patients also and further signify inflammation is an important determinant of the presence and the severity of the minimal HE. So uh, mechanisms remain the same what you see in the patient with the hepatic encephalopathy, but they are at much lower level also in this patient. So inflammation plays an important role, but this biases plays an important role, ammonia plays an important role. Another one is the sarcopenia. 
sarcopenia muscle is one organ in the body which also utilizes the ammonia so whenever there is a hyperammonia so it is converted to the glutamine with the help of the glutamine synthetase also and it has been demonstrated in various studies whenever there is a sarcopenia then there is a higher prevalence of the hepatic encephalopathy or bilateral allergy and this low skeletal muscle index has been demonstrated in cirrhosis 58% uh, which goes up to the 84% if the uh, cirrhot uh, cirrhosis person they also have the minimal h also and they uh, again uh, uh, there is lots of the mal malnutrition also here you can see here this is the normal person with a good skeletal mass also in cirrhotic it is gone also so uh, what happens actually uh, if there is a low skeletal muscle mass and it is particularly a risk factor for the development of not only minimal h but also the over h i just told you muscles they can utilize ammonia by converting it into the glutamine with the help of the glutamine synthetase suppose if there is no muscles then there would be the hyperammonemia because it is the urea cycle is not effective and this hyperammonia it upregulate the myostatin and many other oxidative stress also which further decreases the muscle mass also once the muscle mass is further decreased further hyperammonemia so this is kind of the cycle also we have to break it as far as the patients i would say overall in general patient with cirrhosis we have to look at the muscle mass also and those who have the hepatic encephalopathy we have to see also here comes the roles of the branch chain amino acid because branch chain amino acid are directly utilized by the muscle they need not to be uh, processed through the liver also so i am telling you this is the basis actually the muscle mass is very very important so ammonia lowering strategies here and the combination of the resistance and the endurance exercises they becomes very very important while we are managing such patients diagnosis i think uh, diagnosis then treatment 10 10 minutes so there are so many tests this is the standard psychometric test and this is the fes animal element test continuous reaction time inventory control test the stroop test the scan test eeg and cfm so i will take the important one and tell you how to uh, deal with these tests and which one we should do in our population because the diagnosis of the mhc as far as it is possible it should be in the opds where you are examining the patient so you require the point of the care test at least at the screening level once you find on the screening level one of the point of the care test is positive then you can subject that person or the patient for the uh, gold standard which is the fes so this is the psych fes psychometric hepatic encephalopathy score it is a neuropsychological paper pencil test easy to administer and is considered to be the gold standard and it contains five paper pencil tests number connection test a number connection test b we have replaced with the figure connection test in indian population serial dotting test digit symbol test and line tracing test so they evaluate different different part also of the cognition and uh, it has been validated in uh, many countries also many populations also so nowadays uh, in majority of the centers they are using this test it takes 15 to 20 minutes and moreover it is also clinically relevant in several studies including from india germany spain and many more also usa they have shown that it predict the development of the ohc as well as the mortality also so this is the number connection test a here should be the number connection test b number to the figure but in our population 
the english alphabets were difficult to be recognized uh, who were not very well literate and that's uh, we have devised the figure connection test it worked well and here you can see the serial dotting digit symbol line tracing test and what we found the cutoff was minus less than five minus equal to or less than minus five in other places most of time it is the minus four but it when you uh, validate in your population you might have the different readings also another is the continuous reaction time it is a neuropsychological and the computer uh, computerized test relies on the repeated registration of the motor reaction which is pressing a button to the auditory stimuli that is through the headphone you can see over here he is pressing the button because he is hearing the different dial tones also uh, the notes also the method measures and combines motor reaction speed sustained attention inhibitory control that where we have he has not to press the button which are all key abilities in the daily functioning age and gender seems to exert limited influence and there are no learning or the tiring effects also animal living test this is the simplest one you ask a person who is sitting in front of you just name the animals as much as possible within 60 seconds so does not require any equipment except the stopwatch also and what they have demonstrated it they it uh, basically correlated very well with the gold standard both fes as well as the e is also and it demonstrated to compare favorably the more established mhe measure and to predict the over he also and it also correlate with the severity of the liver disease also here you can see the area under the curve roc analysis 0.72 so okay and what they have divided the score 0 1 and 2 0 is normal if somebody is telling you more than 15 names one is between that somebody is telling you between 10 and 15 names and the score to which is called as the positive ant test is less than 10 and anybody who's telling less than 10 animals is abnormal and you can see over here here so the uh, the authors looked at the development of the overtech which is linked to the score to performance so this could be another one of the point of the care test another is the inhibitory control test if if a y is coming x or they are alternating then it is a response or you can call it the target but if something comes the same y after the y x y to the up you have to inhibit yourself they are called as the lures also and this is the one test but it requires her uh, mm, highly functional patient sector that is the drawback of this thing and uh, they have calculated that if it is more than five layers it has 88 percent sensitivity and the area under the curve this is the original study from the bazaars but when we performed in our institute we did not find like that and in another institute from the italy also they did not find like that what they find that ict is not useful for the diagnosis of the mhc unless adjusted by the targets they have just said they taken the lures, but you have to adjust for the target to be a meaningful. So this is not a, uh, I would say, not a very good test to be repeated or to be done in this patient. Another is the soup test. That is a very good test also. It is a point of the care test also. It evaluates psychomotor speed, cognitive flexibility by interference between the recognition reaction time and the colored field with the written color word. It is also available in the form of the app also. Just see, this is the off state. Off state is basically, the task is to correctly and rapidly press the color corresponding to the color of the symbol presented. So here you can see the hashtags also. It is blue, you press blue as early as possible because reaction also takes into the account. But here it is on state. The task is to correctly and rapidly press the color corresponding to the color of the word presented, not the color it means. So here you will not press the green, here you will press the blue. So, okay, I, the, 
So this is again, uh, you can do in your iPhone or in any smartphone also. So this is again the point of care test. In multi-center US study using adjusted population norm, and this true, was able to diagnose MHC independently and using traditional gold standards. Its performance independently predicted the development of the OHC. So you must have noted by now, whatever the tests you are using, they have to be validated against the clinical events. And the two are the most important. One is the mortality, another is the development of the overt hepatic encephalopathy. And the author has gone one step ahead. They say uh, off state, they have the fibrins. On state, they have the fiber in the conventional that I've just shown to you. What they say is why to do the 10 runs for the 10 minutes? Why not to do only the one and two? So they compare with the other and they found that it is equally effective and it takes only less than a minute or also. So the question that I posed in front of you, ladies and gentlemen, it was that we should be able to do a test or a point of the care test where we are examining the patient. So I'll tell you, there are only the two which are reliable. One is the encephalopathy is true, that is the test or the quickest group or animal naming test. If they are abnormal, I personally recommend that we should go ahead with the PES because it has implication as far as the prognosis is concerned, as far as the treatment is concerned. So coming to the treatment, that is the last part of the, my talk also. And uh, I have taken a lot of time. Can I continue? Yeah, we need to like the treatment. Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So that is the study that we have performed. That uh, after diagnosing the MHC, we have given the lactulose and we have given it for the three months. And there were the three groups. One is the no minimal hepatic encephalopathy and, uh, and we have not given anything. Another is the minimal hepatic encephalopathy group, but we have not given the lactulose. Another is the minimal hepatic encephalopathy, we have given the lactulose. And you can judge at the baseline after the three months, this four column, development of the overtight C, left to the follow-up and the death also. You can see in patient with the MHC, majority of the patient, they improved and there was a reversal of the MHC and the development of the OHC was one and uh, there was no death also, which was not significant because the number was very small in each group. Here it was 31, 30 and the 31. And here, what is the impact? I have just told you the impact on the reversibility. It is useful. Lactulose is useful. What is the impact of the lactulose on the uh, uh, quality of the life? Here you can see this is an, uh, there is no MHG. When we have done baseline and after the three months, there is hardly any difference. But if we look at it, those who have not received uh, 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 this is the effect of the uh, lactulose and these are the scores before at the baseline and when we have given the lactulose they all are most normalized also you can see over here so what we can say that the lactulose were effective in improving the quality of life and what we have further demonstrated that the change in the psychometric score correlated with change in the SIP score, which is the quality of life score also. That means that the improvement in the cognition linked to the improvement in the health related quality of life and it was true at the baseline as well as there at the three months so the improvement in the health related quality of life was linked to the improvement in the cognition function and this is the first study which has demonstrated it now there the meta-analysis they have demonstrated that the positive effect of the lactulose as far as the reversal of the mh is concerned as well as the positive effect on the mortality also no not on the mortality not on the mortality, on the reversal also. Rifaximin was also 
evaluated the same way that we did from a study from the Lidhyana also, from uh, Dr. Sidhu also. They found the similar thing that the reversal of the MHG was significantly higher. Those who have received the rifaximin, two weeks you can see 57% and which rose to 75% at the eight weeks also. And they have also demonstrated the improvement in the health related quality of the life also. We have also evaluated the probiotic published in gastroenterology 2014. Uh, they have shown that there is a trend as well as breakthrough H episode is concerned because these are the patients who have recovered from the hepatic encephalopathy, having the normal cognition also. So breakthrough episode means the recurrent episode of the OHC. There is a trend, but it did not reach the significance. But what we have demonstrated over here, the hazard for the hospitalization market decreased over here. And the, in probiotic group, whatever the breakthrough hepatic encephalopathy episode, they were the low grade and could be managed in the OPD. While on the other hand, they were the severe in those who did not receive the probiotic and they required the admission also. And we found the basis also because the probiotic proved the liver uh, severity status in terms of the CTP score as well as the MELD score. And it reduces the pro inflammatory uh, in, uh, cytokines, TNF alpha, IL1, and IL6 also. It reduces the ammonia also and many other markers also. The, so we have the multivariable, uh, multivariate analysis also. And these two studies, they have demonstrated the reversibility favors the probiotic treatment also 3.291, 2.252, 6.8 CI ratio. And here, uh, the progression to over HE, it is also reduced. This is the meta-analysis of uh, eight studies also, which included our one also. So I think we can stop here and check. Last, 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 last. Sure. So, which treatment we should have to give? I was told to about one hour. That's what I have prepared yeah, for that. Sure. No problem. Yeah. So, which uh, treatment has to be given? Lactulose, rifaximin, l ornithine aspartate, or any other? So, we have that the comparative efficacy of the treatment options for the MHC. And we perform the systematic review and the network meta-analysis also. What we found, the rifaximin and lactulose most effective for the reversal of the MHC and l ornithine l aspartate and lactulose for the prevention of the uh, uh, MHC. What we can say, the lactulose is recommended for the reversal of the MHC and the prevention of the... So this is my the last, last slide actually, how to go about it. Any cirrhotic patient may or may not be having the portosystemic shunt also. We must take care of the sarcopenia. I have already told about it. If these patients, they have the past uh, history of the overt hepatic encephalopathy, anyway, they would require the lactulose or the rifaximin for the secondary prevention here. So there is no doubt about it. There is no ambiguity over here. And if they do not improve, then you have to evaluate for the spontaneous shunt. If you find then the shunt of lesion also. And the rest patient who do not have the past history of the OHC, they must go clinical assessment as well as the mini mental score. If it is less than 25, again you treat it. That suggests there is presence of the OHC, that is the great one also. If it is more than 25, if there is a history of the false ex uh, accident, reduce work productivity, again treat it. If nothing is there here, if it is not there, then neurocognitive assessment is required. As already suggested, either go for the animal naming test or stroop test. These are the screening tests. If positive, the first. If it is positive, then we should treat it. That's what I am trying to say. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the, the approach that we need to treat this patient. If you see the majority of the patients, they are covered over here. It is a very small number of the patients who do not have the past history of the hepatic encephalopathy. And you do the neurocognitive assessment over here. 
if positive we suggest they should be treated but there is not an overall consensus also that's what i feel about it thank you so much